question from Dan. How does Jacob's prophecy to Judah about the scepter staying with him until the arrival of the Messiah align with the historical continuity of the political power in Judah until the reign of King Herod? Christians assert that the scepter was being taken by Jesus, but if not, in what sense does the power still belong to Judah, considering that the Messiah hasn't arrived according to this perspective? Right. That's a really good question. You know, the question uh, surrounds Genesis 49.10. The sons of Jacob are standing around the deathbed of the patriarch, and they are receiving blessings. But if you look carefully at Genesis 48 and 49, they're, they're portents of destiny and character of the tribes. The most elaborate of these blessings are given to Yehuda. Judah wasn't perfect by any means. In fact, Genesis very much contains a record of blunders that Judah made. He's very much like the Messiah, very much like King David. Many mistakes, but at the end, he figures it all out, and he demonstrates leadership. That's a Jewish Messiah. If you want someone who has never sinned and born of a virgin, go to church. But if you're born to a virgin, you're the son of God, what's the big deal, right? What, what makes someone great is not that they were never tempted or never— it, what makes someone great is they're ultimately able to conquer their mistakes and flaws and achieve greatness. I mean, this is so simple, so simple. Now let's come to your question. God tells you who do many things— through Jacob. It's a prophetic blessing. And he says, the scepter will not depart from Yehuda, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Ad Kiyavo Shilo, which means until, we'll just say that Shilo is Mashiach. There are different views of this, but I think that's the correct one, and it certainly is the consensus. So what exactly does it mean? It's also a very strange wording. So we can figure out why it says until Shiloh comes will not depart because, as it turns out, there was another king prior to King David who was not from the tribe of Judah. So that works perfectly with Genesis 49 verse 10. The question is, what does this mean exactly? So there are two ways to understand this. One way is the way Christians interpret it. And what, what they argue is that this passage means that always, there would always be a king from the tribe of Judah. Always. And they would turn to every one of you and say, hey, I'm a Christian. We have a king. In fact, He's called the king in the placard above the cross. The king of the Jews. But where is your king? So Judaism, it must therefore be defective because you have no king now. Do you understand that? And therefore, you must have a king based on this passage. And therefore, you're just looking in all the wrong places, okay? This is fairly straightforward. What's the alternative? What's the Jewish view of this passage? And that is that this is completely incorrect, but what the passage is conveying is that once you have a king from Judah and Samuel anointed King David, so that would be the trigger that would launch it, there would be no king that would follow that's legitimate that is not from the house of David, not from Judah. Okay? It does not mean that at all times there would always be a king for the Jewish people. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that whatever king would emerge would, would be from the house of Judah if it's a legitimate king. Now, you alluded to this in the question in that 
there were illegitimate kings. For instance, the Maccabean family, which revolted against the Seleucid Empire in the second century BCE, they were from the same tribe I'm from. They were from the tribe of Levi. They were a priestly family. Tragically, they assumed a... Um, they called themselves a king. And that's why the Maccabees were largely wiped out because they, they made that error. You know, sometimes you have rev revolutionary movements that become corrupt. That was the story of the Maccabees. Herod wasn't even Jewish. He was an idiomite, which means he came from a tribe of people that were forcibly converted to Judaism. So, so as it turns out, is even Christians would concede that throughout the entire Second Temple period, there was no king. In fact, the last Davidic king was Sidkiyahu Zedekiah. He was the king that was removed by Nebuchadnezzar, by Nebuchadnezzar, right? So Christians would concede that for more than 500 years, there was no king. So it can't mean what Christians are saying it means. So it's a very silly argument. Do you understand? The text in Genesis 49.10 cannot mean what Christians are arguing it means. Because during the Second Temple period, there was no king from the house of Judah. That's right. Herod was not a Davidic king. He was not from the house of Judah. The Maccabees were not Davidic kings, right? All Christians would have to say, right. Herod wasn't even a king. I mean, they called him a king, but he was nothing more than a, a puppet of the Roman Empire. He was nothing more than a the, – the Roman Empire was very happy. Herod, you call yourself whatever you want. But he wasn't the emperor of Rome. He wasn't the real king. He had enormous authority. And he's called the great not because he was a fabulous person or a terrific king, but because he was a great builder. So, you know, it always works this way. When you lie, why, why do honest people, terrified of lying, and we don't want to lie because we don't want to lie, but we'd, we'd be very frightened to lie because we don't want to get caught. I mean, it's not that we don't want to get caught, like go to jail. It just would be horrifying to a normal person. It's just mortifying. If we're in an airport and we see someone arrested and being taken away by the police, every normal person is going, oh, I would never want to be in that predicament, right? But that's how you get in trouble. You get in trouble by covering up. Christianity gets itself in trouble because it makes stuff up. So... The first part is clear that the prophecy in Genesis 49 verse 10 is conveying that whenever there would be a legitimate king, it would be from David. In fact, if you look at the Davidic covenant where we encounter it in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 through 16, that's the heart of it where God literally says to David that um, – because the context is David wanted to build a temple – that he couldn't do that. It's the Kanta. He says, look, you, you may have, you'll have children. Solomon's going to build a temple. I'm going to, the covenant will continue through him. If you have children that are going to sin, I'll punish them personally. But I'm never going to take away the kingship from you as I did from your predecessor, Saul. That's the whole point. So we see there the passage clearly is expressing the blessing. Blessing means that it can't leave Judah. That's what it means. Moreover, finally, <clears throat> just to bury this question forever, is that we have messianic prophecy in Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible that tells us explicitly that the last epoch in Jewish history before the Messiah comes, there will be no king. It literally says that. If you love Hashem, which I know you do because you have other things to do with your life than watch me. Open up to the Hosea. 
Hosea chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Hosea 3, 4 and 5. Where it says explicitly that the children of Israel will abide for many days, for a very long time. This is the last period in Jewish history, and they'll have no king. Just please read it for yourself. They won't have a sacrificial system. None of this supports Christianity. All of it contravenes Christianity, buries the church. Because Christianity says you have a king, that's Jesus. You have a prince, that's Jesus. You have a sacrifice, that's Jesus. And you're all very familiar with Christianity, so you know that I'm not mischaracterizing what Christianity teaches. Look at the, nef- the next verse, verse 5. Achar yashuvu v'nei Yisrael, that the children of Israel will return, uvigshu es Hashem Elohehem, and they will seek out the Lord the God, as David Malcolm and David their king. And when will this happen? And they will tremble in the blessings and the goodness, ba'achres hayomim, at the end of days. So this is clearly messianic. So Hosea is saying that the last period of Jewish history can be identified as a period where there's no king, no prince, Mashiach called a prince or anointed called a prince, and no sacrificial system until the end of days. So therefore, if you claim to have a Messiah now, you have to belong to a false religion. I hope you get this. This is such, it, it, You should right now be going, that's shocking. If you're not, then you missed it. The prophets say the last period of Jewish history before Mashiach comes will be a long time, and there'll be no king and no sacrificial system. And incidentally, they had a sacrificial system during the second temple period. They just didn't have a king. So thank you so much for your question.